Hi. I've been instructed not to go into Michael Chabon's significant artistic accomplishments because apparently they've alerted you to these in your supplementary material and the redundancy might paralyze us all. We might fall to the floor and perish if I repeat any of this stuff. We would need medics, we'd need a mop. So I guess I can't mention his 14 books, including his stunning first one, The Mysteries of Pittsburgh, published nearly 30 years ago when he was four years old, I believe. <laughs> I guess I can't mention the Pulitzer Prize he won for the outrageous and beautifully imagined Cavalier in Clay. And along those lines, I also can't mention the staggering range and complexity and beauty of his 12 or so other books and the awards and commendations they've received or his fine work for film, or even his award-winning songwriting career, which he recently commenced and which he is already kicking ass at because, you know, he's sort of effortlessly great at whatever he does. But that's fine. There's a lot else to say. What's probably not in the brochure is a depiction of Michael Chabon's visionary and inquisitive and passionate mind a brain as unusual and vibrant and valuable to our culture as any I've been exposed to. I realize that that's a weird way to say it. I didn't know how to put that. Being exposed to a brain sounds a little medical and a little illegal, like he showed it to me. Um, but uh, when I read Mr. Shabon's work, whether it's an intricately constructed historical fiction or a penetratingly observed piece of domestic realism, I sense that what brought him to the material was an intense and genuine love for it, a curiosity that is so profound that he transforms himself into the most committed artisan, a person who labors for the beauty of the work, someone so restless that he won't stop until he achieves perfection. This is maybe an obvious thing to say about a major novelist, that he loves what he writes about, but it's not exactly always true, or at least it's not always detectable. With Michael Chabon, I'm talking about love in the conventional sense, as in he would do anything to make his material come to life. He would die for it. Loyalty, devotion, obsession. You get this when you read him. You can't miss it. There's no sign of a cold intellectual calculation behind his books, so much as a kind of irrepressible, deep, instinctual passion. He's writing as if his life depends on it, and he doesn't want to let his material down. Maybe this is what accounts for those elegant and brilliant sentences of his, the ones that zealously rove his subject and touch it and reveal it and bring it spectacularly to life for the reader. I see this kind of intensity with him in person. He's passionate, curious, attentive, sympathetic, honest, loyal. In other words, he is a singular artist, and what he crafts on the page soon enters our lives and makes them richer and more complicated. This is ultimately the pleasure of reading him. And to me, it doesn't matter all that much in the end what he's writing about, whether it's the moon or a doula. He's an artist who will get, in the bottom, he'll get to the bottom of things, revealing their complexity, their relevance to our lives, and he'll perform this magic in the most elegant and seemingly effortless way possible. Various sports metaphors might apply. He's a performer of language, acrobatic, sublime, feverishly skilled, and it's our great fortune to be alive for this spectacle. How often do we get to watch someone so gifted, so uniquely born to the ancient and deeply necessary project of storytelling perform for us at the height of his powers? We're absolutely lucky to have him here tonight. I know that, and I can't wait to hear him read. Please join me in welcoming Michael Chabon. Hi, thank you. Good evening. I'm, I'm overwhelmed by that beautiful introduction. Thank you, Ben. Um, and I was kind of hoping you wouldn't mention the, the whole brain exposure incident, but now that it's out, I'm okay with it. Um, I'm having a hard time deciding which portion to read to you tonight. I think I'm gonna go with one that comes later in the book. Um, but it really doesn't spoil anything. The construction of this novel is a little peculiar in that in its attempt to sort of um, mimic the storytelling 
of a man, an older man who's uh, dying of cancer and he's on heavy painkillers and his mind is wandering, his memories are surfacing. The narrative tends to jump around in time. And um, because of that, I think I can successfully read this portion um, without much in the way of introduction or without spoiling anything. Um, all I'll, I will say is that the, the narrator's grandfather has, um, in, the 19, in 1957, is fired from his job as a salesman for a company that makes hair barrettes to make room on the payroll for Alger Hiss, um, who has just gotten out of prison and is now considered to be unemployable. But he can get a job as a salesman for a company that makes barrettes. And so the grandfather finds, when he finds out that he's been fired, he, as we would say nowadays, he flips out and he becomes violent and he attacks his boss and um, he suffers a number of repercussions from that incident, which is the incident that opens the novel. Two days before my grandfather surrendered to the New York State Department of Corrections, he drove my mother from New Jersey to Baltimore to entrust her to his brother's care. It was by no means the ideal situation, but nothing ever was, and he felt he had no choice. His mother and father had died of cancer within a couple of months of each other in the winter of 1954. Keep your eyes peeled, my grandfather told my mother. It's going to be on your side of the street. My mother had not seen Baltimore in five years, and it looked strange to her. The row houses had two stories clad in white siding upstairs, red brick down. They made my mother think of gums crowded with teeth. Most of them had flat roofs, but every so often one had a peaked attic. Those were the eye teeth. The houses had shallow porches held up by white pillars. They ran on for blocks unvaryingly, like a vista you might drive past in a dream. I forgot the number, my mother said. My grandfather sighed. He took his right hand off the wheel to fish his wallet from the breast pocket of his jacket. A matchbook from Howard Johnson's fell out of the wallet into the area by his feet. He swore. He returned the wallet to his pocket. His tone was calm, but that meant nothing. Find it, he said. My mother leaned across the seat and felt around on the floor among the petals and her father's black wingtips until her fingers kicked against the match cover. Found it. The comb of matches had been torn away cleanly along the strip where you struck a light. She turned the match cover over to the side on which my grandfather had jotted down an address. My mother read the numbers aloud, but they failed to register. She was remembering the Howard Johnson's restaurant, where my grandfather had taken her one particularly fine Saturday not long before. Their nearest neighbor, Mrs. Lopes, had unexpectedly dropped by the house that day, bringing along two albums of photos from a recent visit to her sister in Altoona. My grandmother had shown what struck my mother at the time as remarkable, if not excessive, interest in the Pennsylvanian travels of Mrs. Lopes. My mother was thrilled when my grandfather, who harbored little patience for their neighbor, abruptly proposed a father-daughter outing. He drove my mother out to visit a petting zoo with goats, sheep, and an irritable alpaca named for Ima Sumac. My mother knew that at 14, she was too old to enjoy a petting zoo. She had enjoyed it nonetheless. There were no other visitors, and the animals seemed eager for company. They rushed to greet my mother and never let her out of their sight. In the enormous barn, there had been a tire swing lashed to the highest rafter, and at the end of the visit, the farmer had set up empty soup cans along a fence. My mother, always a bit of a dead eye, had shot all but one of them off with a 22 rifle. On the way back from the petting zoo, they stopped at Howard Johnson's, where my grandfather had consented to my mother ordering a lunch of French fries with a side of peppermint ice cream. The day was hot, but inside the Howard Johnson's, her bare arms and legs had prickled as her sweat cooled in the air conditioning. 
there was frost on the scalloped metal ice cream dish. My grandfather had made a comic show of disgust as he watched my mother languidly dip each fry into the pink mound of ice cream before eating it. But she could see something else moving behind his face, some deeper pain or preoccupation. After a while, he got up to go to the men's room. He came back with a pack of Palmel cigarettes. He was not a habitual smoker, but there were months when he would go through two packs a day. The lighter, engraved with a molecular diagram, was out of fuel, an oversight she could not remember ever having seen him commit. Their waitress had brought the book of matches in their aqua, white, and orange cover. My grandfather lit a cigarette and settled back in the booth. The look in his eyes of painful assessment appeared to have departed. He complimented my mother on her marksmanship and then, unusually, told her a story from his boyhood. It was a brief tale, but a good one. It concerned a friend of my grandfather's, a boy called Moish, who had been shot by another boy with a 22 rifle. The tale concluded satisfyingly with a bloody fingertip wrapped in a sheet of newspaper and carried home in the victim's pocket. There's an asterisk for that, and the footnote reads, my grandfather never told my mother what he confessed to me 32 years later, that he had been the shooter. <laughs> when they got home that afternoon from their outing, the radio in the living room was playing big band rumba music, but the house was empty. There was an envelope on the kitchen table propped against a candlewick vase that held white peonies cut from the back garden. My grandmother had written my mother's name on the outside of the envelope. Her penmanship, improved by nuns, made every word look like notes to be played on a celesta. In the envelope, my mother found a red feather wrapped inside a letter informing her that her mother had decided for the good of the family to return herself for treatment at Greystone. Uh, the mother, my grandmother, my grandmother, suffers from pretty severe mental illness. The meaning or origin of the red feather was information my mother never ascertained. My grandfather swore again and stepped on the brake. You were supposed to be looking, he said. I was looking. When you drove it in reverse, a car made a sound that my mother imagined to be the whirring of her father's displeasure. My grandfather craned his head around and backed them past three houses with his right arm slung across the top of the seat back. He stopped in front of a house with an attic story. Its porch was hedged with bare azalea bushes. Instead of brick and siding, it appeared to have been clad in a grid made of hundreds of cut stones, brown, purple brown, and gray. Its porch had been lost or been deprived of its pillars. In their place, someone had installed trellises of wrought iron entwined by wrought iron vines. In one of the two windows that looked onto the porch, my mother saw a woman's wide face before a muslin curtain fell across it. My grandfather cut the engine. My mother grabbed handfuls of the skirt of her jumper and squeezed. Her eyes burned. Tears dripped from her chin to the Peter Pan collar of her blouse. It was so quiet in the car that she could hear the patter of the tears. My grandfather made a soft click with his tongue, irritation or pity. My mother pinned her scant hopes on pity. I have no choice in the matter, my grandfather said, forgive me. No, said my mother. Her daring surprised her. Her heart was thudding against her breastbone. My grandfather opened the door on his side and got out of the car. Fair enough, he said. He put on his gray worsted suit jacket and shot his cuffs. He straightened the knot of his gray and black tie. He studied the stone face of the house. There's another footnote. It says, in all likelihood, the house had been clad not in genuine stone, but in a molded concrete simulacrum known as form stone, then in vogue among Baltimore householders. 
He came around the front of the car and opened my mother's door on his way back to the trunk. My mother wiped her face on her sleeve and climbed out. She followed him to the back, sorry, she followed him to the trunk of the Crosley, which held two suitcases of clothes, a train case with her toilet articles, and her glass animal collection, her portable record player, and a box of 45 RPM records, among them Wake Up Little Susie, New That Week, and Dark Moon by Gale Storm. Let me worry about this stuff, my grandfather said. You go ring the bell. My mother stood on the concrete checkerboard looking at the stone house. It had felt so good to say no. She contemplated saying it again, but her Uncle Ray beat her to it. No! He was standing on the topmost porch step. He was wearing a sky blue suit piped in white and a green necktie patterned with gold circles over a gold shirt. He was taking her in, making a show of it, his arms folded across his bony chest, looking her up and down. He shook his head, his mouth turned up at one corner as though ready in a moment to smile. Unbelievable, he said, impossible. My mother had not seen very much of Uncle Ray since the move from Baltimore in 1952. Since then, he had grown more outrageous, and she loved him for it. The improbability of his cars, his clothes, and of the gifts he brought her, a brown-skinned doll wearing a hat of wooden fruit and a red dress embroidered with the word Havana, a canvas sack stamped golden nugget containing a vial filled with gold dust, scandalized my grandfather in a way that paradoxically also seemed to bring him pleasure. When Uncle Ray came around, he and my grandmother would do the talking. My grandfather would just sit listening at the table or once on a blanket spread under a tree. Uncle Ray's stories of his life featured people with suggestive or humorous nicknames and towns or neighborhoods with questionable reputations. To narrate that life's incidents and activities required an impenetrable jargon. The talk went over my mother's head so completely that nobody bothered to shoo her away. When Uncle Ray got to the end of a story, my grandfather would sink his chin into his hand and say something like, I don't believe it, or that's appalling, or simply, oi, Renard, why? But sometimes he would be smiling. Hi, Uncle Ray, my mother said. Hello, dollface. She went up the steps and put her arms around Ray's neck and kissed him on the cheek. It was smoother than her father's cheek. As always, he smelled of gardenia and tobacco ash. She did not have to go up on tiptoe to kiss him. Not yet 15, she was two inches taller than he was. Look at you. Nobody told me you were already done growing up, he said. This is going to be a piece of cake. My work is done. My mother did not reply. Right, Uncle Ray said. I'm looking forward to this, aren't you? I guess. Sure you are, baby. This is going to be fun. There was a flat metal mailbox by the front door with a wire bracket to hold the evening paper. The name on the mailbox was Einstein. My mother had been told that this was the name of Uncle Ray's landlady, but seeing it spelled out on the mailbox gave her an uneasy feeling. It was a name long since affixed to matters of crucial importance that she knew she was never going to understand. You said a girl. The voice was pitched low, masculine. It belonged to the woman my mother had seen at the window. She seemed old to my mother at the time, but in retrospect, my mother thought she must not have been 60. Her black hair was grained with silver. It jutted out on either side of her head in two fins that curved upward at the tips, the toes of a pair of Persian slippers. She was wearing what appeared to be a lab coat over a blouse printed with chrysanthemums and a brown skirt. She drew a thread of some bitter odor along with her when she came out onto the porch. Ms. Einstein, Uncle Ray told my mother, this is a girl, Mrs. E. She's only, how old are you now, sweetheart? Fourteen. Mrs. Einstein 
looked my mother up and down, her hands folded across her chest. My mother decided that the odor was coming from Mrs. Einstein. Later, my mother would learn that her uncle's landlady worked as a receptionist at a veterinary hospital out in Pikesville. A smell compounded from carbolic and the secretions of animals' fear glands followed Mrs. Einstein wherever she went. Fourteen, Mrs. Einstein said, nonsense. She turned to Ray, what do you take me for? I could produce her birth documents, Uncle Ray said with smoothness and assurance, worrying my mother who was not sure she owned any birth documents. If you really think it's necessary. The summer before, as a hurricane was about to hit the Gulf Coast of Texas, my mother had seen a picture in the newspaper of people in its path nailing sheets of plywood over the windows of their houses. A similar procedure now seemed to be undertaken by Mrs. Einstein with the expression in her eyes. It's all necessary when you're involved, she said to Uncle Ray. I have to take every precaution. Now, Mrs. E, when you're involved, I read the fine print. She shook her head infinitesimally, as if a fuller expression of disapproval might implicate her in whatever mischief her boarder had gotten himself into. Then she went back into the house. What did she mean, you said a girl? My mother asked her uncle, does she think I'm a boy? Uncle Ray's teeth were veined with gold. When he smiled, you felt he was giving you a glimpse of the wares he planned to sell you. No, sweetheart, he said. She thought you were a woman. He started to ruffle her hair, then changed his mind and settled for a pat on the shoulder. Don't let her, well, well. He was looking past my mother at my grandfather, coming up the walk with one of my mother's suitcases under each arm, holding the record player with his left hand and the train case and box of records with his right. Shame on you, Mandrake, Uncle Ray said to my mother making Lotar here carry all your bags. He wouldn't let me help. No, he wouldn't, would he, Uncle Ray said. My grandfather kept his head down, his eyes hidden behind the brim of his hat. He tromped up the porch steps and tried to bull past my mother and Uncle Ray without saying a word. Hey, sourpuss, Uncle Ray said. He stepped into his brother's path. He waited until my grandfather looked up from under the brim of his fedora. Can't even manage a hello? My grandfather paused. He nodded without meeting his brother's gaze. Hello, he said. That's it? That's all I get? Move it, my grandfather said softly. Uncle Ray stepped aside with a show of mock alarm. My grandfather went through the door with the luggage. We're putting her in the attic, Uncle Ray called after him. Good luck getting all that up the ladder. I'd help you if you weren't such a jerk. My grandfather reminded his brother that he didn't need help. Uncle Ray rolled his eyes at my mother. She wanted to smile, but could not manage it. She was already apprehensive about having to sleep in an attic. She had not been told that the attic was reached by a ladder. This worried her too. What if she had to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night? Good thing he's not sticking around. Uncle Ray said, himself and Mrs. Einstein under the same roof. Marciano versus Moore, duking it out for the heavyweight sourpuss title. <laughs> He's going to prison, my mother said, remembering now that in spite of the affection, a sense of mild wonder that Uncle Ray inspired in her, there had always been something about him that got on her nerves. He was not a serious person. If you weren't going to prison, neither of us would have to be here at all. Uncle Ray looked as if she had slapped him. My mother felt instantly sorry. She forced herself to smile. Anyway, she said, I put my money on daddy. For the sourpuss title? Definitely. How much? Five dollars? You're on, Uncle Ray said. They shook on it. Mrs. Einstein fed them. The $15 a week she charged Uncle Ray for a room with its own bathroom on the second floor of her house did not include meals. Mrs. Einstein took no interest in food. 
On the rare occasions when she cooked, the results were nothing anybody would pay money to eat. Though not observant, she shopped at a kosher butcher. She would buy the cheapest cuts, all string and gristle, sear them, then submerge them in a signature brown gravy that reminded my mother of jello, only salty and hot. The vegetables were boiled until safely gray. Once a week, Mrs. Einstein forced herself to sit down and eat a piece of fried beef liver with grilled onions. And if Uncle Ray and my mother were around, she forced them to eat it too. Her husband and son had always refused to touch liver, and they were dead. And she was alive. On that first night, however, she served an excellent dairy supper. She had stopped at an appetizing store and brought home smoked whitefish, pickled herring, a dozen deviled eggs. She put out cottage cheese and some sliced celery and carrots. For dessert, there was a marvel of a cake, a slender block frosted with chocolate that revealed, when Mrs. Einstein sliced it open, gaudy layers of pink, green, and yellow separated by ribbons of raspberry jam. Mrs. Einstein had no illusions about her table. She had no illusions about anything, except maybe the tonic properties of beef liver. But she knew where my grandfather would be headed after he departed her house. She felt that his last free meal ought to be edible, at least. You're very kind, my grandfather said, pushing away his plate. Not really, Mrs. Einstein said. She looked at my mother, who was just then contemplating asking for a second slice of ribbon cake. One is enough, Mrs. Einstein said. My mother nodded. She put her fork down. Maybe your brother told you I have doubts about this arrangement, Mrs. Einstein said. I have a hard time picturing Reynard looking after a child, and I worry that the burden is going to fall on me. I don't much care for children. I had one of my own that was more than sufficient. My grandfather turned on his brother. You said it was fine with her. Fine is a relative term, Uncle Ray observed. Maybe I ought to have said as fine as anything ever gets with this one. My mother told me that she still remembered the heat spreading across her cheeks as she listened to this exchange. A spasm of restlessness took hold in her legs, a kind of panic of the muscles. She ran through a handful of smart or angry or cold remarks she might toss at Mrs. Einstein on the subject of children and their feelings toward Mrs. Einstein. She reconfirmed with herself the certainty that she had nowhere else to go. I don't need it to be fine, Mrs. Einstein said. Obviously, the girl needs a home. It was not yet 8 o'clock when my grandfather took his hat from a peg in the front hall. My mother tried to stay put on Mrs. Einstein's sofa. The sofa was upholstered in pale pink chenille sealed in a layer of clear vinyl. <laughs> Under her circle skirt, my mother could feel her bare thighs sticking to the vinyl slipcover, and she pretended that the adhesion would be sufficient. But in the end, she tore loose and ran to her father. He suffered her to put her arms around his waist and her cheek against his shirt front. When he saw that she was not going to make a scene, he took hold of her head with both hands and raised her face to his. If I thought you were not up to this, I would not ask you to do it, he said. Do you understand? My mother nodded. A tear spilled from her left eye, streaked down her temple, and chimed inside her right ear. You're tough, he said, like me. He lowered his lips to her forehead and left the scratch of his whiskers on it. Hours afterward, lying on a folding cot in Mrs. Einstein's attic, trying to fall asleep, she could feel the abrasion of his kiss radiating heat across her forehead like a sunburn. It was only then, in the dark 
and the smell of old luggage and galoshes that it occurred to my mother she should have asked my grandfather what he would have done if he thought she wasn't up to the ordeal. She lay there in the dark, picturing to herself all the bright forms his mercy might have taken if only she had not been so tough. That's it. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> I know these poor people. I'm so cruel to them. You are. You, you invent people and then you torture them. Exactly. And people applaud. <laughs> I presume you get paid. We're a cruel race. Uh, fantastic reading. Thank you. Thank you. It's really strange to hear our voices echoing mm -hmm. on the back wall. I'll, I'll get over it. Okay. Um, so this book, Moon Glow, I think we were we were swimming once, and you said so. And I'm just going to let everyone picture that, because <laughs> we were wearing these outfits. Yes, we were. <laughs> Don't specify what body of water it was. No, no, I won't. I okay. won't. Um, and you said I'm writing a. I think I, I think I'm writing a fake memoir about my grandfather. Is that what I said? <laughs> Something like that. And uh, you know, it, I was I was angry and jealous and all those things. <laughs> One has to be if they if they know you personally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I guess I'd love to hear how this book got started and how it came to that. Was, was that sort of something you, you thought of and just did? How did it lead into that that you could you know, tell someone else? That you, um, you know, it, I, I was preparing to write what I thought was going to be the follow-up to Telegraph Avenue, my last novel, and, um, and it was something very different from Moonglow. And I had been doing reading and research and preparing in various ways to do that. And um, a day came when I thought, okay, well, this is it. I'm gonna start at least taking notes on that book and maybe jot down like what I think it's gonna be about and all the it kind of It was actually things. like a day that you- Yes, today is the start day. I don't know, whatever, it must have just been, I couldn't, I, yeah. I, I, I had been, I was ashamed of how long I had been since I had been, been working. Like a week and a half. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so, I, and I went out to my studio behind my house in Berkeley where I live and I sat down and this story that I had been told a few times in my life popped into my mind. Or I had, maybe I had been thinking about it sort of semi-consciously since the night before because I had been reading um, Train Dreams by the late Johnson. Dennis Johnson, um, which you know is of all of his work, it's my favorite of his books. It's such a beautiful novel and yeah. um, I think for one thing, it tells the story of one man's life in a kind of compressed form. And yeah. that was maybe a ghost standing behind the thought that I was having, which was um, there's this incident in that book. It's not really that important to the story in Train Dreams, but um, when the main character is an old man, I think his name is Robert, when he's an old man um, in this small town out in the West uh, in the 50s, this train breaks down in the town and everyone goes out to see it and Elvis is on this train, like the oh, young, yeah. like sexy, cool Elvis yeah. Presley is on this train and he's like waving to people from the windows. And I just, I love that moment where, you know, the, where the, these two lives are intersecting. They're obviously in this case, one is an actual person and one is fictitious, um, but uh, there's just something delightful to me about that moment and it was, it stayed with me so that when I sat down to start working, I found myself thinking about this story that I had been told about my grandfather, my actual grandfather's brother, my Uncle Jack, having been fired from his job in the 60s, not the 50s, as a salesman for a paper company in the Puck Building um, to make room on the payroll for Alger Hiss. Wow. And at that point, it wouldn't have been Alger Hiss's first job out of prison. So, I mean, yeah. but anyway, th that's all I knew. It was Puck Building, paper company, Alger Hiss, got fired. And that seemed like a similar kind of story to me where this um, actual, not fictitious man's life had intersected yeah. with this big arc of American history and Alger Hiss, you know, um, in many ways, the Cold War story is an even bigger arc than, say, like, the, the rock and roll story. Yeah. And, um, 
And I couldn't get it. I just kept thinking about it. And I started to write it and to sort of embellish it in a way to try to imagine it. And I immediately switched my uncle, my great uncle, I called him my uncle, to my grandfather. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I made that switch, then I was writing fiction. And um, I had all this liberty suddenly to say whatever I wanted. And I didn't know anything about what, how my Uncle Jack had reacted when he found out he was losing his job. So I could just make it up and I have him have this spectacular tantrum and all of these things. Um, so the first voice was the narrator's voice. It was. Because I, when, when I read it too, I wonder, and there's, you have this incredible conceit. You have a narrator who's sitting at the deathbed of his grandfather receiving this story. Mm -hmm. Yet for the most part, the, the book is told in the voice of the narrator. We do, I'm curious how you balance, first of all, just the grandfather's own voice and the way the narrator takes it and absorbs it and puts it back out and makes, makes narrative, like in the scene you just read. Right, well, I mean, deciding to do it as a memoir, as a fake memoir, helped. And I mean, and maybe that's why one of the reasons I did it. I, um, you know, I mean, I, as a novelist, I have always had um, very, I've looked with somewhat jaundiced eye on the rise of the literary memoir. And I will quickly I was say. I ask you about that. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, 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 I mean, some, you know, some of my best friends are memoirs, but I, I you know, I mean, I love, <laughs> Like this boy's life and stop time by Frank Conway. Like yeah, these are yeah. like some of my and uh, speak memory and yeah. I mean some of my favorite books are people's memoirs or autobiographies. But um, what always bothered me was this um, this privileging of yeah. the supposedly true memoir over a work of fiction that was you know revealed that prejudice was revealed in stark in a stark way with the whole James Fry controversy sure. where he took a novel, called it a memoir, and got a big book deal and got an Oprah. So um, Do you think calling it a true story is a sort of like invented cultural value or, or is there something I mean, deeper there? I think it's it's totally understandable. I feel it too. I mean there is this it's a very primal question that children ask when you tell them stories. Like, really is that happen? true? Did that really happen? I mean I understand that impulse. I have it myself as a reader. When I'm reading a, an avowed work of fiction, if, there are st if I start to get a sense of, you can have that feeling of autobiographicalness and you, you look at the author photo and, and she has curly blonde hair and the protagonist has yeah. curly blonde hair and you're like, hmm, yeah. you know, and I wonder if her husband's an alcoholic like the husband in this book. I mean, I feel all those things myself, so I yeah. totally understand it, but it bugs me because to me it's so obvious that a, a really good lie is much better than a half-assed truth. Mm -hmm. And um, so when I was... Half-assed as in a poorly told, or, but autobiographical. Or just not really the truth, because obviously memoir is invented to some degree, and I think in a lot of cases to a very large degree, and it's not even like a... It's not like the memoir is lying. They think they're... Yeah. They're, they're saying, this is what I remember, but th those two words I remember, those are like the most unreliable words in the English language. And we all know that. Yeah. And we all have, you know, if you have siblings and you get together with them and you start to reminisce about what happened when you were kids, it's, you know, that he, dad wasn't there then or, you know, you weren't there. Or, I mean, I remember things that I wasn't present for. That happens all the time. Yeah. So we all know that. And yet somehow we check all that knowledge at the door when we are presented with a a memoir, we're like, oh, this is all true. It says memoir on the cover. Um, so that bugged me, and yet it felt like there was a power to be gained from that. And I, I started to feel like this voice, if I wrote it in my memoir voice, it would enable me to sort of both to go into the minds of various characters, primarily the grandfather, to the mother in this chapter, yeah, yeah. the mother, and but maintain the narrator's voice and yet find ways of allowing the natural sort of speaking voice of the person whose point of view I was in to enter into it. So like when I'm in the grandfather's point of view, I think the metaphors tend, they're, they're often sort of scientific, scientifically based yeah. metaphors and it's so It's a kind of close third person, but it's actually done by a character, your narrator, who has your name right. and is also a novelist. Right. Right. Were you thinking that because he's also a writer that perhaps that's an extra layer of, let's say, plausibility around his ability to, like, someone could tell, tell, 
tell me a story and I really wouldn't be able to tell it back that well. Mm -hmm. Your narrator can hear all this stuff and synthesize right. it. Right. But I mean, it's also obvious, and then, I mean, this is me sort of pl playing with the whole idea of memoirs, supposed factuality, or tweaking it, yeah. because it's obvious, it ought to be obvious, that the narrator is telling us things about his grandfather that even on drugs, yes. the grandfather would never have told his grandson, right? Like, yeah. like about sexual encounters with the grandmother and yes. so on, and going into sort yeah. of some I mean, he has a He has a level of access that, you know, even a Dickensian third person right. omniscient right. narrator wouldn't necessarily Right, have. and so then and if I'm yeah. saying, hey, this is a memoir, people, and, and I, you know, uh, I mean, I was trying to have a little bit of fun with yeah, that idea. Absolutely. Um, and you have this note at the beginning yeah. announcing that it's a memoir, but that you're going to change the facts to suit you. So mm -hmm. you're, you're having it both ways in a way, right? Mm -hmm. you're, you're announcing some kind of factuality. But what's funny is even though, well, when I'm reading this, I know how playful you're being. There are moments that I get these sudden tinges of the feeling of autobiograph mm -hmm. uh, autobiography, mm -hmm. a feeling of real kind of intimate disclosure. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting because in a weird way, you would almost be warding it off with all the playfulness. Yeah. But it happens anyway. I didn't, you know, I, I, I was trying to walk a line there. I, like, I didn't want it to be too jokey or too winky. Sure. So I wanted to always have, I mean, my, 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 baseline was always like, does this sound like something someone writing a memoir would actually say? Um, and if it didn't, I would try to leave it aside. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, when I, after I had been working on this book for a few days and I started to try to imagine the scene that opens the book of the grandfather being fired, I started to wish, like, I, you know, I got that, oh, this seems to be going, maybe this is what I'm gonna do now. Um, I, I need more information. Like I, I need, I'd like to know more about what happened that day in, in, in reality at the Puck Building. So I reached out, I emailed my, uh, that uncle's, one of his daughters, uh, my cousin, and then her daughter, who's my generation. Yeah. And I said to both of them, what do you remember what, about when Uncle Jack got fired to make room for Alger Hiss? And the cousin who's my generation wrote back and said, I never heard that story. <laughs> And, and thus your research was concluded. Exactly, exactly. And, my, and her mother wrote back and said, that's not the way I heard it. Uh, what I heard, uh, as far as I know, my, my father was never fired from a, a job in his life. What I heard was he came home from work one day and he said to my mother, you won't believe who's working as an office supply salesman, Alger Hiss. Like, can you believe that this guy, that's what he, it's come to. Did you ever trace how you had come? Well, that, was, then, that was like my next question. Yeah. And I'm like... Where did I? I feel like my grandfather told me that. Who like, lied to my you? grandfather told me this story. Yeah. Who else would have told me? So then I asked my mom, "What do you remember about yeah. Uncle Jack and Alger Hiss?" She said he got fired from his job to make room for <laughs> Alger Hiss. And so I said, "Where did you hear that story?" She said, "From my father. I, I, he told it many times." So then I was like, "Well, I feel like I heard it many times too." So who was lying? Yeah. Was my grandfather lying? Yeah. Um, was he? embellishing was he not lying but that's again like with the sort of charity that we give to a memoirist like that's what he remembered so it was the truth to him um or did my uncle lie to my cousin to protect her from knowing that he'd been lost his job so she wouldn't worry i mean I, but and there's no way of answering that question and yeah. there's no way of knowing all the people who know what happened are dead um and that was the moment where i thought okay that's what this book is about it's going to be about like the truth yeah quote, unquote, in families and how, who decides what happened, how does it get decided? And then, and then in, on some level, then how does that call into question this whole memoir sure. enterprise? Did you think ever about the reader and the degree of bafflement he or she might be feeling throughout this? I mean, as I we never think in, about that, <laughs> ever. <laughs> no, about what, which? Um, well, yeah, I guess I guess I'm curious. Like what's true? What's well, not like? as as the grandfather reveals more, there you have an, an amazing way of kind of blending really outlandish stuff with really quotidian mm -hmm. stuff. And I was just curious, since we do have this mediated story and we have a narrator who himself might be unreliable, mm -hmm. um, how concerned you were, I guess, ab about how the reader was reacting in terms of plausibility. <sighs> Um, well, 
I mean, there, I guess there were moments where, I, I mean, a lot happens with this grandfather. He yeah. has a lot of yeah. adventures. Yeah. So, um, you know, I knew there was what you might think of on the one hand uh, as a danger of overloading the plausible incidents that any one man could have in his lifetime. Although I felt like there, the the that's a pretty high bar. Like I've known really people that have a lot of crazy things that happened to them. But what I wanted, I did want to sort of suggest not, and it's never, I've never think of it as that the grandfather might be lying ever. Yeah. Like to me, at least we are meant to believe what the grandfather is saying. But I was willing to, cons to have readers, some readers, I was comfortable with a reader thinking, well, maybe the narrator is mm -hmm. making this. Yeah some of this up but in fact the narrator the author is actually making almost all of it up of course so um you know i didn't i didn't ever want to try to suggest that the um that the grandfather was thought he was lying yes. or telling tall tales to his grandson no, he's really he was throughout he was saying what he remembered i mean but that in itself is of course like a dubious thing a key character to, to this question for me would be the grandmother mm -hmm. who I think is an amazing character in this book um, and you you leave a lot of mystery around mm -hmm. her we don't really know much about her just how she got to America I don't mm -hmm. want to want to give away too much but she also very explicitly kind of embroiders her own stories mm -hmm. and it looks like a kind of there's a sort of flag waving around that like here's a character in the book who's mm -hmm. sort of openly really exaggerating maybe lying mm -hmm. and i think like you don't let us get too too close or at least we don't get into any stable position mm -hmm. with her right and i started to think of the narrator and the grandmother as kind of operating possibly with some similar techniques yeah i mean and i think there's a you know the grandmother in as many ways is the narrator's tutor in the art of storytelling, yeah, and like, and you know, the idea of a story, um, you know, a story can be a synonym for a lie, um, um, and that there's an image that gets repeated a few times in the book of the house of cards, um, and the grandmother has this um, fortune telling deck, sort of like a tarot deck called a Lenormand deck, and she um, uses it when the narrator's a little boy. She'll deal. She'll have him deal three cards, and then she'll make up a story based on the three cards. So you get this idea of stories, and then the House of Cards has stories, and yeah. and it, it gets conflated in the narrator's mind in a way. I mean, I think you are. She, she is this source of story ultimately, or that whole storytelling impulse is coming through her. Um, but she, that character caused I me mean, the most problems of any character in in the book, and and I. Um, you know, the idea of her being mysterious or enigmatic, as I like to think of it, was a kind of a crutch that I leaned on. Ah. It was like a, it was an excuse that I made for a long time while writing the first drafts of the book and focusing on the grandfather's story and on the, yeah. the story of the family, the mother and the narrator. And I just thought, well, this woman's enigmatic, so I don't really <laughs> have to say anything about her because, you know, the more I say, the less enig enigmatic she becomes. So, um, and I contented myself with, and I allowed myself to use that excuse. I mean, I'll, I'll find any excuse I can come up with to not have to write something more, yeah. you know, thing like good enough. Uh, yeah, she's yeah. an enigma. Yeah. Everyone will be fine with that. So <laughs> then I gave that draft to you know my trusted readers. Um, uh, you know, first among them. I yell at my wife, and all three of my trusted readers all, they had different kinds of responses, but they all were in unanimous agreement, more grandmother. Hmm. Like, there's not enough grandmother yeah. in this, and she's... True of all books. <laughs> well, true. I mean, there's almost no book that can't be improved by a grandmother more. or a cowbell. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but, uh, so then I was like, oh, crap. You know that feeling where you get busted by yeah. your readers? Like, I, I, there was a part of me that knew I was cheating, and I was using that as a crutch. But then I thought, well, but, but seriously, okay, fine, I accept this criticism. I have to put more of the grandmother in, but, but she is an enigma, and her, the truth about her is a mystery for, for her whole life, and for her husband's whole life, and for her daughter's, most of her daughter's life. And um, how do I, how can I show this woman? I don't wanna go into her point of view, and I'd always had this as yeah. sort of like a ground rule. Like, if I go into her point of view, I'll have to cheat to maintain 
the enigma because she knows the truth, presumably. And if I'm in her point of view, it's not fair to withhold that from the reader. Yeah, ultimately, that's right. I have to divulge it. So how am I going to handle this? And then I just, I had this, it doesn't seem right to call it a brainstorm or inspiration because it's so obvious, but I'm her grandson. Like I'm, the narrator yeah, is yeah, her grandson. Yeah. He grew up with her. Yeah. He has known her since he was a little boy. He had all these memories of her and yeah. time they spent together and things they did and how she behaved and things she told him. And I hadn't written any of that stuff I into see. it. I so see. I just went off and I did what I called the grandmother draft where I just, I actually wrote a hundred pages, new pages, and where I told the whole story of the grandmother from the grandson's point of view. Yeah. Um, and that led me to knowledge about her insights, and I suddenly discovered that actually she wasn't an enigma to me at all. I knew everything about her. That's so interesting. Because to me, it was it was there was something so poignant about the narrator having what I saw as more limited access to the grandmother than he did, let's say, to his mother mm -hmm. and to uh, his grandfather. Right. And that I don't know. That felt it's really humanized the narrator so much to mm -hmm. me and made the story th that unknown felt so powerful and because it is we are dealing with a kind of superhuman narrator mm -hmm. he has he has a lot of power mm -hmm. right to to take these stories and put it all together sure. even if it's partly fabricated right and to feel that powerlessness around the grandma yeah that she was, then then i felt like it it was it was an an in um being enigmatic had a kind of integrity. Yeah. That it was, she right. maintained it right. in the direct face of someone who's just and studying he felt, yeah, her. He's giving everything he has. Right. He's not withholding. Right, exactly. Um, well, can, this is maybe a, an unanswerable, but can you, can you, we're sort of still on this topic, can you make any distinction between autobiographical truth and literary truth? Do you, do you think of those things as, as opposed? Is there anything to be said? Is, it, is that just too pie in the sky, too big? Um, well, I mean, I, I think I do believe that a work of fiction has the power to tell the truth um, to a degree and in a way that nonfiction can't ever yeah. aspire to, no matter how well-researched, no matter how well-processed and um, organized the material is, no matter how well the author understands the subject. Um, re ultimately, reality, in my view, you know, so-called, is impervious to meaning. Like, any meaning that reality has is a meaning that we impose on it, we, that we find in it. It's the, you know, the, the face of Jesus in the tortilla. Yeah. And um, a pareidolia, I think it's called. And, and you know, so a, a, a writer of nonfiction is always ultimately going to be bumping up against the fact, the knowledge, either conscious or unconscious, that in trying to find the meaning in some kind of non-fictional recitation, he or she is actually imposing a meaning upon it, and that it, it objectively is just a string of random events that happen more or less simultaneously or in some kind of sequence. Sure. There is causality. I'm not saying there's no causality, but, but what that causality, whether it means anything and what does it mean, that's open to interpretation. To me, what's beautiful about fiction is that that imposition of meaning is not just um, you know, necessary, but it's what we go to it for. We turn to fiction because while we're reading a work of fiction, life makes sense in a way that it just doesn't, in, in, at least not to me. So, um, you know, to me, literary truth is, is the, in some ways I'd say it's the, it's the more truthful, but on the, on, the, in the, on the other hand, it is also kind of a elaborate construction yeah. um, that doesn't exist without somebody imposing it. It's funny that no one has ever really made the argument that fake news might have more power because of its inventiveness. <laughs> well, uh, that is, I mean, that's actually a good <laughs> argument. I think you could and make a case. Be more that. resonant and maybe tell us more about ourselves. I mean, say a lot of fake news does seem to explain things that are otherwise inexplicable. Yeah, it seems to fill a need. <laughs> um, so would you rule out ever writing a memoir? Um, well, I mean, I, you know, I had you that. You could open with that time we went swimming. <laughs> Exactly, in an unnamed body of water. Um, in our I've, I've written those short pieces that are mad for amateurs, yes. and yeah. you know, and I'm 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 actually working on a nonfiction, personal, memoiristic kind of piece right now, a short piece um, for a collection I'm going to have coming out next year. But um, I feel I always feel really uneasy 
yeah. while I'm doing it, and partly because the, the, the urge to embellish, the urge to invent, the urge to make it better is so powerful. Yeah. And, you know, in my case, I mean, my life is, it's, I'm not like Sebastian Younger or somebody like that, you know, it's like, and I've, I, my life's kind of dull. And it would be so much better if I could just make some of this shit up. <laughs> I could make a much better story. Yeah. And, um, you know, so there's that aspect of it that I'm always fighting against. And I, feel, I do feel the scruple to, you know, I don't want to invent. I don't want to embellish. Yet there are things I'm writing as I'm writing as I'm, I'm aware as I am authentically remembering things. I am aware that I might not be remembering it correctly. Yeah. You know, and I've had I've written pieces that were personal, that were autobiographical, and had you know my mother read them or my brother, and and they said like, there were that you know that happened three times, not two times or whatever, like something that I had it wrong. Yeah. Um, so I'm fighting against that and worrying against that, and then you know, finally there's just that whole, if I'm writing about people in my life, um you know, the fig leaf is gone with nonfiction, where it's like, if it's in a novel... I know, was going to ask you that. I mean, do, it's a novel. do people come up to you and say, you know, that's me, and yeah, why'd I mean, you do that? <laughs> yes. Um, sometimes people in my house... In your fiction. ...say yeah. that to me. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, you know, when the, 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 I've had that experience for a long time. You know, I've, 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 with my first novel, which was admittedly quite autobiographical in some ways, although large portions of it were totally fabricated, but... Um, you know, the, the, the relationship between the narrator and Mysteries of Pittsburgh and his father is it's sort of at the center of his story. And I did draw on my actual father in some ways in creating the character of that father. And so right off the bat, I had to go through the experience of like his reaction. Um, yeah. You know, um, there, there's, there's a line where the, the father in that book leaves a message on his son's answering machine. And it's um, where the narrator says, like, his father's voice, like, he's a big, powerful man, but it's strangely his voice sounded like the voice of Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> and that was almost 30 years ago that book came out. My dad has still not forgiven me for that. Like, he's still, <laughs> like, sometimes he'll, like, it, he'll leave a voicemail true? on my phone, and he'll be like, this is, you know, what was the, ev <laughs> what's the actor who did the voice ev ever? Who know, does anyone know who did Winnie the Pooh in the Disney uh, anyway, um, he'll he'll leave a message in that persona yeah. uh, of that actor. Um, so he's still that's clearly stung, you know. Yeah. Um, and that's something that I never ever would have. I didn't wrestle with that for a second. Like I didn't. I didn't. Yeah. Like there are other things I was like I probably shouldn't say that. Yeah. And that happens a lot. And I did learn pretty early on from the experience of stressing out completely about whether I should say something or not in a piece of fiction or nonfiction, and deciding to do it, having to come out and having the person I was worried about not even notice, yeah. say nothing, not, not just being polite, but they just missed it completely. Yeah. Or this opposite thing where like the thing I just tossed in without a moment's hesitation turns out to be this big deal to them yeah. in a way that I, I still could never have anticipated and I don't really get it. I don't get why you're so upset about this. I, I get that you are. So when that happens enough and then the other thing that happens is, is people coming up to me and saying like, whoa, you really nailed me in that story. Like I wrote a story called A Model World. Uh, it's a title story in a collection of mine and there's a college professor who's a character in that story and I based very, very directly modeled that character on a professor that I had at UC Irvine. Yeah. After it ran, uh, after the story was published, a completely different professor <laughs> who I never had as a teacher came up to me. That he's one was like, "You really nailed me with that one, didn't I?" And I was like, "You know, um, yeah. Wow, you just revealed so much to me about yourself that I didn't know before." <laughs> The whole um, population of professors, really. <laughs> True, I guess so. So, I mean, and yeah, that's happened sure. other times, too, where people... So does all of that then suggest to you that there's no kind of clear ethics about it? It's a it? mugs game to yeah. worry about it. Yeah. I really, I mean, yes, with my children, um, in particular, at particular as they've gotten older, um, you know, when, I'm, when I've written about my children, I've checked with them. Yeah. Now, I mean, that in itself might be... A, I think you could argue that's sort of a questionable process like with my son Abe 
who I wrote a piece for GQ that came out yeah. last year about taking him to Men's Fashion Week. And as soon as I finished that piece, I mean, it's about him, and it's nonfiction. And as soon as I finished it, I gave it to him to read. Yeah. And he, you know, he signed off on it. And he actually, he just had a few fact check things. Yeah. Where it's like, you got the, the brand of sneakers <laughs> totally wrong. Or, you know, <laughs> exactly. So, and I thought, okay, good enough. But, you know, I, I mean, I think you could argue, well, he was 13. Like, what does a 13-year-old really know? Or about? what would you have done if he had? I would have been fucked. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. It's like, yeah, don't run this, Dad. Right, and he's a sensi really sensitive kid. He's sensitive to m c cues from me that I may not even be aware I'm giving off. Maybe he r looked at me and he was like, it's really important to my dad for me to approve this. That's what I'm going to say. I, mean, I don't know. Yeah. But um, in general, you know, I would rely on them to be able to say, please don't say that about yeah. me. Um, apart from my kids, I really just have stopped worrying yeah. about it. I think you just can't. And you know what I say, like when it's... What I, my line is always to say to my parents, that's what you get for raising a writer. <laughs> so you're married to the novelist Ayla Waldman, yes, you, you guys. Um, could you talk a little bit about what that's like, uh, reading each other's work, not reading oh, each other's work? Oh, you mean as a novelist, not being married to Ayla, period. What's it, the day-to-day? -day? What do you eat? <laughs> <laughs> um, What's, what's it like to uh, be living with someone who's also writing books? And um, I wonder if you know anything about I don't that know. subject. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, well, I mean, it, it, I think it works surprisingly well. I mean, or maybe it's not really surprising. Um, you know, we are in the same business. Yeah. And, and it's a business that even calling it a business feels like sort of a weird way to designate it. And a lot of people, most people who aren't writers don't really understand that it actually qualifies as working. Yeah. You know, because it looks like you're just sitting. Yeah. And it, sometimes it looks like you're, you're just yeah, the sitting. The live and, footage of writing is yeah, yeah. not very dramatic. And there, there's often some Google involved in it, too. And it look, kind of could look like you're just web yeah. surfing. Um, <laughs> and, you know, so to be married to someone who yeah. is facing the same issues of procrastinating and, and being the only, your, your only boss, the only person watching what you do, punching the time clock and all of those yeah. things, to be, to be married to someone who's in that same boat, I think it can be confusing to some to be married to someone who has a, a real job and goes out and works nine to five. Right. Or, they come home and you're still in your pajamas. Exactly. Yeah. And you're like, no, you don't understand. I added an adverb. Yeah, today. I wrote eleven words, <laughs> and it, it was. was like, and I wrestled with. It. I looked up the etymology yeah. of the word, and it actually is the perfect choice because it like alludes to this yeah. motif of grapes that right. I have going here. So, um, you know, there's that, and then there's just also um, the hand holding. And I mean, we're we're very involved in each other's work from the very beginning, from the moment I start to get a tickle of an idea and think. Uh, maybe I want to write that, you know, she's the first person I would try to describe it to. Um, you know, usually in those early stages, the other person's job is just to say, that sounds really great. Yeah. Um, maybe you should watch this movie or have you thought about this or whatever. Just offer encouragement um, through reading multiple drafts, editing each other's work, and then in the, in the dreaded publication period, the reassuring yeah. and hand-holding. Yeah. And um, administering of cold packs and all that kind of stuff, um, yeah. sedation. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, it's just like a full service yeah. thing. And I, um, and I really rely on her. I mean, I, she re she relies on me to, especially to be an editor for her. Mm -hmm. um, and I will be pretty severe with my editorial pencil. No, I mean, no more severe than I am on myself. And f f um, for me, she's really invaluable as a sounding board for plot and when I get stuck in a jam and I'm like how I I totally got this character into a corner and I yeah. can't figure out how to get him out she'll come up with a suggestion or um, and then she's also my gauge for um, the emotional calibration of stories if she's really good at letting me know that I've neglected a character like the grandmother yeah, in this yeah. book especially when it comes to female characters um, I feel like I've I have a kind of uh, vulnerability or weak spot when it comes to writing female characters that I'm very conscious of, very aware of, and have worked very hard to um, ameliorate. Yeah. And she's been really invaluable mm. in that to me, being a woman herself. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, and you know, all it takes is one woman, of course, to check, and you've spoken for all women, obviously. But, no, but she's, you know, she's, um, 
really good. I mean, it, it started very early with Wonder Boys where we had just, we weren't even married yet when I, were we? Maybe just married when I finished a draft of Wonder Boys. And, um, and it had a different kind of ending. It had a much more downbeat ending than the book currently has. Um, kind of a sort of existentialist sort of yeah. ending. And um, I gave it to her re to read, and she burst into angry tears. Um, and she was really mad at me. And she's like, you cannot do this to the, like, I just spent 350 pages, we, we know with these characters, and you're just sort of brushing them off, and you're, you're dumping them, and, and you haven't, get, it's not fair. Yeah. The way you, and it was true. I mean, I was just in a hurry to get out of this stupid <laughs> book. And like, you know, it was like, it was the existentialist equivalent of blowing everything up. Yeah. It was just like a big explosion and the book's over, right? And, sure. and um, you know, and that was her first, that was an important moment for her. That was like the first moment where she intervened yeah. and said, you know, and she wasn't writing yet at that point. It was, I think, scary from her point of view. And she's like, but this, just as a reader, I hate this, what you've done here. <laughs> now that she's written so but many. She probably put it less bluntly interesting books of her own. Has, has, has she changed as an editor for you since she's written more? Um, I mean, that's an odd question. I mean, I think she's definitely just more confident in her opinion than she was. She used to be a little more tentative and now, pfft. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, that's over. I mean, we definitely, there's a lot of arguing that goes into it. Yeah. Um, uh, it's really the same it doesn't matter who's the one who's being edited, who's the one who's doing the editing. It works in both directions, something like this. The reason that you think that is because you're stupid. <laughs> and you don't understand anything about what I'm trying to say or do here. Yeah. If you weren't so stupid, you would see, you know, yeah. this is the perfect way to handle this And that doesn't situation. go over well? Um, I mean, I, sometimes I have a little bit of a hard time with it. Yeah. Um, and, and then there's an argument. Um, and then inevitably, the, the, the writer, the one being edited, completely collapses yeah. and says, oh my god, you're so right. This is a disaster. Help me. What do I do? Um, and it, it got to be so, such a repetitive cycle that we, I, we have tried, we've worked, and I think we've, we're better at just skipping the argument yeah. now. Um, um, like I just, I'll just, I feel the anger, but I'll just realize that eventually I'm going to give way. So I'll just pretend Surpre like I'm not mad. It. I'll just be condescending, kind of coldly condescending. You discover denial. Exactly. <laughs> well, I'm a master of denial. So, um, and then especially if there's a deadline and I think in a way it was like deadlines taught us we didn't have to argue because when there's a deadline, there's no argument. Yeah. And when we Past realize that, like, wait, so when it's, we, we, if we can do this without arguing, maybe we could yeah, yeah. manage it. Um, we actually directly col collaborate more and more now on TV projects. Um, nothing that has made it to your screens yet. But and when we collaborate truly like that, where we are both writing something, um, there's a lot less arguing. There's almost there's very minimal mm. arguing, and, and, or there is. It's sort of like arguing, but it's more like my idea is better than your idea for this thing right here. Okay, great. Well, we have a bunch of questions from the audience. Okay, are there hostile ones? Can you um, start with those? There's one that's just, who are you? <laughs> um, here we go. Uh, why do you quote Von Braun about there being no dark side of the moon, there's only darkness, when the story clearly espouses the light, magic, and infinite possibilities of the moon? Oh, that's where that question's going. I thought I was going to be called to task for stealing that line from... Um, the, it's the very That's last the thing you one. hear at the end of the album, the Dark, Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon. If you listen with headphones, as I have many times, sometimes under the influence of substances that make your hearing somehow more acute and sensitive, yeah. the last thing you hear is um, a man with a thick British accent who I think was the doorman at Abbey Road Studios saying there is no dark side of the moon really matter of fact it's all dark and um, so I took that quote and attributed it to Werner von Braun um, oh. as a way of signaling to the stoner reader that this was a work of fiction yeah. <laughs> this questioner has just failed the drug test totally this person has the drug test needs to immediately go out buy a really good set of headphones get I don't have some, this uh, stats some on what drugs cush and listen to the whole album to the end 
Um, but I mean, thank you for the, in, the implied intention behind the question. I mean, I, the light, I mean, I guess in a way, it gets back to that idea of imposing meaning, finding meaning, and yeah. our power that is both our blessing and our curse as human beings to impose meaning on things. Yeah. To it, it, that, that power has led us as a species into some of our worst crimes and delusions, and it is also the thing that you know, enables us to continue to survive and prosper. Yeah. And um, to me, that you know, moonlight, moon glow, is, is, a, is, a, is in a way is a kind of figure for that because of course the moon doesn't have any light, right? right? It's, right. it's an illusion, the, yeah. or maybe illusion is not the right word, but it looks like the moon is shedding light, but it's just reflecting the sunlight. Yeah. So, and in fact, the moon is not even apparently silvery the way we think of it, or even light, light gray the way we tend to think of it. It's almost black. Yeah. It's really dark. So mm. there's something in that image of the beauty of moonlight and the purity of moonlight and the, and the way that moonlight can sort of change the way that we look at the real world around us and make everything somehow look magical and enchanted. And that at the same time, it's completely, it's just bouncing sunlight. Yeah. I mean, the glowing moon is the moon we have. And after a while, you don't want to keep reminding yourself that it's not really. Right. Good. No, right. And when we live yeah. with those, yeah. yeah, we live with those illusions all the time. Um, you know, the sunrise, the sunset, those yeah. things that it seems like that what, what we say it, we believe it on some level, even though we know it's not yeah. it's happening yeah. at all. Um, okay, uh, another one. Mr. Shaban, I'm so thankful for your open letter after Charlottesville condemning the Nazi groups. Do you think that many of us Jewish Americans are too scared to speak truth to power? What made you do it? <laughs> um, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it was just... Um, I always, you know, I had, I have n nothing good to say, and I have no positive thoughts whatsoever about our president. But, but, but I mistrusted that, you know, like, so the part of me that before Charlottesville, the part of me that thought that was saying things to myself like he's a Nazi or he's yeah. a Nazi sympathizer or, you know, this guy in the White House is a Nazi, or that guy is, in, is a Nazi. Yeah. They, I, as much as, in a weird way, I wanted to believe it, if that makes sense, yeah. because I just think the, 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 there seems to be no bottom to that man. Um, but there was a part of me that felt like I had to reserve judgment. Yeah. Like there's a, there's a part of me that wants to give the benefit of the doubt, even to someone who's clearly doesn't deserve it. And, um, and I, feel, I felt like if, I felt like that. And then, then Charlottesville happened, right? And I felt like, well, the mask is off, yeah. if there ever was a mask. And now you see, right? There's perfectly many fine people, right, on that side. So, and then I thought, well, if I'm, as, you know, as a Jew, uh, admittedly like a progressive, left-leaning, Democrat voting Jew, if I was willing to s still cling to some shred of the benefit of the doubt, um, then what about people who are, who maybe voted for, Jews who maybe even yeah. voted for him, or Jews who maybe they didn't vote for him, but they were willing to be more charitable and extend, or that their sympathy or their support for Israel is so strong that, you know, when someone says they support Israel, they are a strong supporter of Israel, then you, you, then you give them a big benefit of the doubt. Um, I could understand it in a way suddenly. And I thought, now that I can understand it and now that I see how clearly, how obviously it's been betrayed, maybe it's time for me to try to say something to people who either have been just giving the benefit out or whose support for Israel is so staunch, so strong, sort of, you know, in a way, Israel right or wrong, that they were willing to overlook or like be contented with like, okay, yes, that Gorka guy seems kind of like a Nazi, but like, he, okay, he resigned. Yeah. And you know that you're making yeah. allowances, you're making yeah. excuses, and, and I felt like now, if, I'm not gonna make any more excuses, and I think it would be behoove all Jews, whether they, wherever they stand on the question of Israel and Palestine, or wherever they stand on the question of electoral politics in this country, to just like, let's not 
kid ourselves anymore. It's time to wise up. Yeah. I mean, I had this feeling, and my wife, the night of the election, you know, we, we had this, um, we went to bed, we were, you know, upset, devastated, et cetera, and then we had that conversation of, you know, uh, led by Ayala, initiated by her, like, what do we do mm. if the time comes, if things turn in this country the way they did in Germany, yeah. you know, in, in after 1933, and there's a big part of me, I'm, like I said, I'm a master of denial. Like there's a huge part of me that's saying, don't be silly. Yeah. That's, this is America, that was Germany. Yeah. That can't happen here. It's not, the situations aren't parallel. They yeah. seem parallel in some ways, but really they're not. Germany barely had a democracy at all before all that happened, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm that guy, right? I yell it is the, like, let's pack now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> She was one of the people who brought the Canadian servers down. You know, she, was, she lived in Canada. She, um, you know, so she, she's the one saying, pack, let's, maybe it's time to pack our bags, or maybe it's at least time to decide when is the time yeah. to pack our bags. Like, let's have that conversation. I really didn't want to have that conversation at all. Um, and yet, and, and both of us are haunted at that moment, as I'm sure is the case for many Jews um, you know, in this room and everywhere you know, by the knowledge that, by the knowledge of hindsight, right? And by the yeah, knowledge sure. that there were people, there were so many people like me in Germany in 1934, in 1935, in 1936, disbelief. saying it's, yes, it's bad, but he's a clown or whatever. And, um, you know, I was so, I remember reading in a, um, uh, one of um, Zabald's books, um, he recounts this, just in passing, almost this incident where like a, a, a synagogue, it's a synagogue somewhere in Germany that during World War I, where many Jews, German Jews were very staunchly patriotic and, and supported the Kaiser and supported the German war effort. And this synagogue had a beautiful copper roof and they, the congregation ripped off the roof of their, their synagogue so it could be melted down to, yeah. you know, for the war effort. And like, you know, that incredible blindness. I mean, obviously, how could they have known, right? But, and yet there's that, it's haunting mm. to, uh, to know that in such a short period of time, you know, all that patriotism, all that feeling German yeah. um, counted for nothing. And I couldn't, po nobody could possibly feel more American than I do. Yeah. And, and I'm haunted by the knowledge that, you know, that was true about German Jews, none of them, or Hungarian Jews. You know, Hungarian Jews were such patriots yeah. for Hungary. And, um, so I was in an awkward place in that conversation in bed that night because I knew I was being the master of denial. But yeah. on the other hand, I don't want to panic either. Yeah. And um, I have reassured, I have been since reassured, little less by the sort of behavior of my fellow Jews as Jews than by my fellow Americans overall in the, yeah. the resistance. And, the, yeah. and the, um, the, the, you know, sometimes I start to get the feeling that, that the president is like a, a hairball that has been swallowed by this country and that we're trying spasmodically to cough him up. I think that might be a good place to <laughs> yeah. end. Yeah, always good to end on a hairball. <laughs> good. Yeah, I agree. Um, thank you so much thank you, for ben. your reading. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. Thank you.